Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Ashish Pal. I am a scientist E in Institute of Nanoscience and Technology, Mohali, Punjab. Today I am going to discuss a module, quantification of non-covalent interactions under the paper nanobiotechnology. So what are the objectives of these uh, modules? So we would like to get an introduction to these non-covalent interactions in between these nanobiomolecules. We would like to know, secondly we would like to know the principles, then the terminology of these uh, interactions, different types of interactions. Thirdly, once we know this interaction, utilizing these, these interactions, we would like to go for a design strategy for these nanostructures. And fourth, with this designing nanostructure, we would also like to see corresponding applications or approach towards application of these nanostructures. This paper, nanobiotechnology is a perfect mix of basic principles and applications. I will start the paper with taking 10 modules on nanobiomolecules and their interactions. Eventually, other instructors will show different applications of these nanomaterials in applications such as pharmaceutics, drug delivery, uh, against uh, food, uh, food technology and cancer therapeutics. So what is nano? We know that 1 nanometer equals to 10 to the power minus 9 meter. But just to get, get a physical feel of it, we can think we take our earth and if we divide the earth in one crore pieces, let them be all spherical, then normally you get a football, football size uh, object. Now, if you take that football and make it into 10 crore pieces, then one piece would be of nanometer size. You get it? So that is equivalent to something called Buckminster Fullerin. You must be already knowing that is the first nanomaterial, one of the first nanomaterial known. Now, if you look at from other side, if you take, let's say an ant, okay, that is in millimeter size. Let's get some feeling of the nano world. Well, so that is, that ant will be in macroscope, is a macroscopic creature, right? If you now take, let's say a human hair, human hair is, Normally, the diameter of that is 10 micrometer to 50 micrometer. Now, that is the only thing your human eye can actually resolve and see to the most. But if you now go down even lower, let's say you, you talk about red blood cells. Now, red blood cell, that it will be in some point one sub micron uh, dimension, but your eyes, through your eyes, you cannot see. Now, if you go further down, let's say DNA, you must be hearing about DNA. DNA is of nanometer size, let's say one or two nanometer size, three nanometer size, but your human eye cannot detect it. Now, that regime, that regime DNA uh, between one to 100 nanometer, where DNA also falls, that is actually the nano dimension and that is where we are interested in. So how do we see materials? So how do we see those nanomaterials which are in nanometer dimension? Suppose you want to see any object, how do we see it? Normally the visible light, what is the wavelength of visible light? That's between 400 to 800 nanometer. When the visible light goes and you know, falls on that object and it, it comes back to our eyes, then we can detect it. Normally, if you are looking for an object, the object dimension is much bigger than the visible light wavelength all right so using visible light we can see that's why in micron size object and even if it is for red blood cells as i was talking about even if it is sub micron dimension still it is more than the visible light well our eyes cannot detect it but using a lens through optical microscope we can see it but suppose 
it gets down to DNA, their dimension is let's say 2 nanometer or 3 nanometer. Now that is already lower than the visible light wavelength. So visible light cannot really detect or we cannot see uh, DNA through using visible light. So we need to go for a special microscope that's not optical microscope that is electron microscope where instead of taking visible light we use electron as a source of it's not light but as a source of wavelength. So how can you design nanostructures? Well there are two approaches. One is top down approach so basically you are having a macroscopic object and you are engineering down the material to the nano scale. The another, another approach is bottom up approach and that is where I being a chemist would be interested for. So what we do is that we assemble molecule. We assemble molecules which are in sub nanometer dimension to larger object in nanometer dimension in different regimes of nanometer dimension. So we start with atoms and those atoms we connect covalently to molecules and these molecules if we can self assemble into larger molecules that is something called supramolecule or supramolecular aggregate that will give us a control on making nanostructures in different nanometer regime. So eventually we can actually take it in a bottom up approach we can take it to uh, something like mimicking some kind of organelles or we can also make it uh, to cell uh, making artificial cells. So a lot of things can be done if we follow this bottom up approach uh, to make or design nanostructures. So what is supramolecular chemistry? We all know about the covalent bond formation. Here you can see these two building blocks which are colored blue, they come together and form covalent bond. Normally this covalent bond formation involved high energy and stability of the product. But when if you see the diagram, two red color building blocks are coming and interacting with that blue colored molecule, they do the interaction in a non-covalent way. So this gives you the idea of supramolecular chemistry. Supra, supra means something above. So supramolecule means something beyond the molecular interactions. If you look at the history of the advent of supramolecular chemistry, it all started a discovery of structure of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953. It was followed by many important discoveries, but three important discovery by Donald Cram, Charles Pedersen and John Mary Lenn stand out for their synthesis in cyclophane molecule, crown ether complex and cryptand. This molecules were became so important that this got them Nobel Prize in 1987 and this molecule they have very high structure specific interactions with selectivity. In recent time in 2016 Nobel Prize was awarded to Jo Pierre Shavaz, Fraser Stoddard and Ben Feringa for their contribution in the field of design and synthesis of molecular machine. They designed something called molecular lift where they employed the interactions between host and guest complex which can alter their conformation on external stimuli. You can see here they have used crown ether complex and this crown ether complex can form host guest complex with diammonium pyridinium compound and upon external stimuli it changes its conformation and this entire guest molecule that gets translocates. Similarly Ben Feringa's group they have developed something called molecular nanocar where they design the molecule exactly that can be thought about as a nanocar because upon external stimuli there are some molecule they changes their conformation and the entire molecule that actually moves in one particular direction. Next we look at the difference between non-covalent interaction and covalent interactions. 
on your screen you see a and b two building blocks they are forming a supramolecular complex a dot 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 b and a and b they are forming a covalent bond a b normally these non covalent interactions are weak in nature that involves less than 25 kilojoule per mole energy but in covalent bond formation it requires more energy if you look at the diagram given below which are ascribed to non covalent interaction and covalent interaction you can see the non covalent interaction the product is more stable however the energy difference between product and the starting blocks they are not much so however they are thermodynamically controlled but they are reversible that means they can form and break continuously but in the case of covalent bond formation the product formation depends on the activation energy of the starting the free energy diagram of covalent bond formation shows that the product formation is usually kinetically controlled that means it depends on the free energy of activation and usually the covalent bond formation the products are stable in nature so overall we can say the non covalent interaction are weak and reversible in nature now how to quantify these non covalent interactions that's what we are actually going to discuss in the rest of the module so we must know a term called binding constant which can be known as association constant or formation constant in biology people use the reciprocal of binding constant or association constant and that is known as dissociation constant if you take the reaction a plus b which is forming a non covalent complex or supramolecular complex ab so the forward pathway of that complex formation is given by k on and the backward pathway of the that is the dissociation process that is given as k off and the overall binding constant or association constant that is k that can be given as k on by k off which can be equated to their equilibrium constant of the complex divided by the equilibrium concentration of a into equilibrium concentration of b this k which is the association constant this can relate to then the if we plug it in the thermodynamic equation that is delta z0 equals to minus rt ln k we can actually get the free energy of the complex formation in biology the reciprocal of this process that is the dissociation process people in biology there is a common uh, trend that they denote the process by talking about the dissociation constant kd if you look at the three systems which the first one being the diamino pyridinium system interacting with the uh, diacid the second one where 18 crown ether is interacting with a potassium ion and the third one uh, the where the biotin is binding with the streptavidin we can see that the association constant uh, for all the three complex is quite different and in fact for the case of biotin binding to streptavidin the association constant is in the order of 10 to the power 13 now what does it say if you now convert that into corresponding free energy of the process you can see the free energy changes in all the three systems from minus 18 to minus 76 now this can also translate into the other parameter that means you can say that for the complexation to happen 100 percent you need much lower concentration in the case of the biotin streptavidin complex because this is very very stable or you can say that the binding constant is very high so it can happen in even nanomolar concentration however in the other cases like where diaminopyridinium is binding with di acid or di carboxylate that is involving a concentration which is molar in nature now how is the relation between delta z0 and binding constant you can see if the binding constant that changes the order you can see the how delta g changes and in fact if you plot delta g zero with log k you can always 
get a linear plot. So far we have seen a binding constant for one single reaction. What happens when the binding constant of a consecutive reactions are involved? So you can see the corresponding reaction where M which is solvated by water that is reacting with L and uh, this is the first step that's why the association constant has been given as K11 and it forms ML complex and water gets replaced. Now this additional solvated metal if it reacts with ML complex and it forms M to L this is the second step of the process. So the K12 that is the second step binding constant that can be given by the ratio of concentration of the complex divided by the corresponding reactants for that particular step. However, the overall binding constant which can be termed as beta 1 2 can be given as K 1 1 into K 1 2. Eventually if you can take a log of that that you can actually say that log beta 1 2 equals to log K 1 1 plus log K 1 2. So how can you determine the binding constant? There are many techniques uh, known for determining the binding constant. However, each technique can be applicable on a specific concentration range or they are involved with typical range of binding constant. If you say NMR, NMR you can employ to get binding constant in the order of 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 5 which involves samples in the range of um, concentration 1 to 100 millimolar. However, UV vis and fluorescent spectroscopy can determine a very high binding constant and they are very sensitive. So, you may not require much sample. So, your sample can be in between micromolar to nanomolar range. There is a completely different technique that is isothermal titration calorimetry or ITC commonly known where it actually takes in between somewhere the concentration between 1 millimolar to 1 micromolar and it can give intermediate range of binding constant. So how do you determine the binding constant? So one approach of determining binding constant is that you calculate the equilibrium concentration of all the species and then plug it in to get the thermodynamic parameter and get the binding constant and this approach is used in many spectroscopy like UV, fluorescence, NMR etc. There is also another approach that is a calorimetry approach where you measure the heat of complexation and you get all the parameters once you process the data of heat of complexation. So how do we experimentally measure binding constant? For that if you are measuring A plus B equals to AB supramolecular complex. So what we have to do is we take one binding partner at particular concentration and we tighten it with the other binding partner that is B. And we monitor the entire process using NMR, UV base or ITC. And what we plot is on the Y axis percentage formation of the complex with respect to B and another side you put total concentration of A. And then we fit this curve and by the curve fitting there are different softwares available we can find out the binding constant. Let's say for this the curve the Ka is determined to be 100 mole inverse. If we are determining binding constant from NMR so normally this binding process and the NMR time scale this two time scale becomes very important. So there are two possibilities. One is the binding process is faster, that the exchange is faster than the NMR time scale, or in other case, the binding process is slower than the NMR process. So the right side shows the binding process slower than the NMR process. So then in that case, you can find out all the species present in the equilibrium concentration. Species due to the complex or free species, all you can see. However, if it is faster, which is given in the left side, so what you will see, the NMR cannot really distinguish and NMR will show you an average peak or chemical shift to particular point. Uh, so what eventually we will look at in the curve where you will plot B 
with the chemical shift intensity and you can see the intensity goes up in the case of slower exchange which then the nmr time scale which involve tight binding of the species the binding constant can be directly evaluated by the simple integration of the bound and the unbound host and guest however this is not in reality and most of the supramolecular complex their exchange is very fast or the the dynamics is somewhere in the intermediate range which is comparable to nmr time scale that's the reason uh, you always get to see the average of different species and the chemical shift also changes so in that case if you plot the guest with the chemical shift you get a plot and you also see that you know, the free host that trace comes down however this curve you can fit with the with the, the different softwares available something like eq nmr and if you fit it into that software it gives you the binding constant we can also find out the binding stoichiometry of the complex using job plot for this experiment what we do is that we take total concentration of host and guest constant and then we change the host and guest ratio and measure the nmr or uv signal and in nmr we measure the signal chemical shift and then we plot the mole fraction of host and in y axis we plot the concentration of the complex and we get the following where there is a peak which appears now if the peak appears at 0.5 then it can be 1 is to 1 complex if the peak appears at 0.66 then it can be 2 is to 1 complex in favor of host another interesting feature is the shape of the job plot now if the job plot is very sharp you can see from this following graph you can see there the job plots sharp job plots indicates very high binding constant however you can see that k11 which is 100 mole inverse that gives a very broad job plot so that involves with lower binding constant next we look at determination of binding constant from uvb spectroscopy as i said uvb spectroscopy is more sensitive and you can have a high binding constant determination in very low concentration range as compared to nmr let's take the simple case where when you are forming host and guest complex only that complex has absorption band the other two they don't have absorption so if you look at the example where iron binding ligand both of them doesn't have any absorption band however the complex has color and it shows with the titration of iron um, into the ligand you can see the absorption bands develop so the entire absorption is due to the host guest complex so if you can express the association constant in terms of the concentration of host guest you can and you measure the uv base and the corresponding absorbance you can get a curve and which you can fit in the space shift software you can actually find out the binding constant we discussed a simple case where only the complex that has absorption however in reality both complex and one of the free ligand they may have absorption band and this is one of the case where you can see this particular ligand which binds to lead and this ligand itself you see the solid line that is due to the ligand once it binds start we titrate it with uh, lead 2 plus it changes its absorption lambda max and also it becomes intense however one interesting point you can notice that there is a isosbestic point at around 255 nanometer so that is an direct evidence that this free host and the complex they are directly in equilibrium without involving any other intermediate species from this titration once we get the absorption value and we plot it and fit it with the space ship program we can actually get very accurate uh, binding constant with stoichiometry so we have seen the binding constant measurement from nmr where we measured the chemical shift value 
And we have seen also the winding constant determination from UV waves where we uh, determine the absorbance change. However, we can also measure binding constant from isothermal titration calorimeter. And in this case, we measure the heat of complexation. Normally in this instrument, there is a cell which is kept under adiabatic jacket and in that cell there are two chambers one is reference cell another one is sample cell where you take your sample and keep on adding ligand uh, and that means you titrate the sample with your ligand and find out the heat of complexation graph of heat of complexation with time as you keep on adding the ligand and we can see for each injection there is a peak at the total peak area that actually can give you the enthalpy change for the process and the peak shape how sharp or how broad they are that actually gives talks about the kinetics of the process now when we integrate all the peaks and we plot with the molar ratio of the ligand then we can actually find out this curve now the curve shape when we fit it then that actually gives the binding constant and the total heat change that also we can find out from this curve that is delta h and the inflection point of this change in the curve from there we can also find out the molar ratio that means you can find out the stoichiometry so the good thing is that from a single experiment you can find out delta h stoichiometry and also the binding constant now if you plug in the thermodynamic equation delta g0 equals to minus rtl and k you can also find out the delta s because you know already the delta h and delta g from the binding constant so you can also find out the entropy value so this is very unique that you can find all the thermodynamic parameters from a single titration. So now we have learned binding constant determination from different te techniques. However, it is very important that we should use the right concentration regime for different experiment. So in this particular curve it shows you that, that if, if you look at this log k equals to one, that particular cu curve, that has only given around 50% of complexation. But if you look at log k equals to 3 and log k equals to 2, that gives more or less 90 to 100% of the complexation. However, in the other extreme, if you see log k equals to 4 and log k equals to 5, the transition is very sharp and uh, they get completed to 100% very quickly. However, this log k equals to 5 and log k equals to 4, the data, it cannot discriminate between these two different binding constant however the best data you can see where the inflection point and also the change of the curve shape you can find out the difference between the binding constant so ideally 20 percent complexation and 80 percent complexation in between this if you can tune your concentration regime then you get the data best data Okay, so let's summarize the module. What we have learned from this module? So we have learned about binding constant and different definition of binding constant and how this binding constant can be measured using different techniques and different techniques like UV, NMR, calorimetry. This we have learned how to you know use them in determining binding constant and not only that which particular concentration range we can use and which for which sect of binding constant we can determine these techniques then we have gone a little bit into details we have uh, learned about uh, binding constant determination from nmr looking at the chemical shift and normally we also learned that uh, this nmr time scale is actually much slower than the dynamics of these uh, non-covalent interactions so that is why you see an average species that's number one takeaway then 
when then we moved to uv and we looked into uv a very simple case where only one particular species is showing the uv absorption and if you if that is so you can directly uh, plug it plug the value and get very easily the winding constant but we also learned that no reality you may have uh, situations where more than one species will show absorbance then you have to get accordingly it will be a little complex uh, algorithm but there are softwares available using which you can actually fit the data and you can find out the binding constant but also we learned the uh, not only the binding constant you can also find it find out what is the what is the stoichiometry of the complex and that we learned job plot how to find out whether it's one is to one complex or two is to one complex and lastly we also touched upon calorimetric method to find binding constant and we showed that that is much better if you have that particular concentration regime you can doing a single single experiment you can find out all the thermodynamic parameter and stoichiometry and lastly we also showed which particular concentration regime of both the uh, binding partner you should take so that you get a perfect regime let's say we also discussed 20 to 80 percent complexation that is where your determination of binding constant will be foolproof thank you